Hey guys, it's Mahel here and today I'm going to be going through how to get a graduate job in the UK and I'm joined by a very special guest, Tanya de Grunwald, who is the founder of Graduate Fog and we're going to be going through different questions such as how exactly you can get a graduate job, what you need to get a graduate job in terms of what you should have on your CV or writing a cover letter and also whether COVID will impact the graduate market and if you should be worried about that. So make sure to watch the full video and stick around as there'll be a lot covered in this video that you may not have known about before, but will know about after you've watched it. But before we do get into the video, if you haven't already, then make sure to click the subscribe button and click the bell to turn all post notifications on so that you don't miss out on a single video as soon as it goes live. But without further ado, let's get into it. So I'd like to start by introducing Tanya. So Tanya, if you could introduce yourself actually, uh, who you are, what you do, and why basically the viewers should care about you. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's, uh, that's actually a really good intro as well. Um, so um, I started a website in 2010 called Graduate Fog, um, which was mainly meant actually as sort of careers advice. Um, my background's in journalism, but very quickly what took off was the blog particularly because I was naming and shaming um, lots of famous people and big companies that had unpaid interns. So I started doing lots of naming and shaming, calling out lots of famous people like, like Simon Cowell and Philip Green and Tony Blair and all these kinds of people who were basically using unpaid labor. And I was basically slagging them off, which was really, really good fun. Um, and then I would work with um, big newspapers and the BBC and The Guardian and people like that to get much, much more press for those stories. So, so that's kind of where I am. And I, and I was really a campaigner um, with a kind of journalism background. I'd, I'd written a book already about how to get a graduate job, um, which was a sort of prototype for ones I've written since then. Um, I am, I've always been really interested in what happens after graduation. There's been an awful lot written about tuition fees and the impact that has had on young people um, and on, on the job market. I'm particularly interested in what happens after graduating particularly that kind of awkward bit in between um, finishing university and starting a job. Um, I, I think there's, and, and I'm particularly interested in people who like myself, I'm not sure about you, but um, who maybe don't have a particular calling to do a certain career and what those people do. Because I think there's a sort of myth that you have to know exactly what you want to do when you leave university. And it is just that, a total myth. So I've, so I've been really interested in that area. Um, so I started Graduate Fog in 2010. I was running it for a long time for no money at all, whilst also doing freelance journalism, which by the way is quite, also quite a tough way to make a living. Um, but I used to write for Grazia and Glamour and all those sorts of people at Cosmo. I used to write about dating and then I wrote about money and then I wrote about careers. And um, that was really fun. So, so I was doing that for a long time. And then um, actually more recently, I've been working with employers who actually have some money versus graduates who don't. Um, so, um, and they, I now work with good employers of young people and help them to do better at being good employers and also meaning that they can talk to each other, which generally means that they just generally continue to progress. So we talk a lot about things like unpaid work. We talk about um, social mobility and diversity and mental health and apprenticeships and graduate schemes and all sorts of stuff like that. So, so I'm basically pushing forward for better jobs for young people and for the world of work in general to be more welcoming to more young people from different backgrounds. There, is lots, of, there are lots of reasons to be encouraged by this. Um, so things are, things are changing fast. Most recently I've written a book called How to Get a Graduate Job in a Pandemic, which is in fact free before you, before you think, oh here she is hawking her book, it is actually free. I decided that I wanted it to be free for anybody to download, no matter what your financial background. Um, so basically I got the employers to pay for it. I know, um, I'm good to you. So that was, that was a really good thing to do. So I wrote that um, in like the end of the summer, the autumn. Um, and so that's had loads of downloads already, but I'm really keen to get that to a wider audience. So thank you for inviting me today. No problem. And you actually raised a few good points in your introduction alone, such as unpaid internships, which we're going to talk about because I myself, for example, didn't know that this was legal until a few months back in a Guardian panel that I was in with uh, Tanya. So I'm sure a lot of you will be thinking about unpaid internships to try and get some experience, but actually they are illegal and you shouldn't be doing that. So we will be covering that in depth later. Philip Green, obviously today, ASOS took over his Arcadia brands. So that's something. And also 
well, has the uh, pandemic made graduate jobs harder to get? That's also something we'll be covering amongst many other topics. So the first question I'd like to ask is, how exactly do you get a graduate job? Where do you even begin to look? Do you go onto employers' websites directly? Do you look on LinkedIn? What do you do? Um, the fact you're asking me that question raises questions for me about why your university career service is not already telling you the answers to these questions, considering that you would think they would be perfectly placed to do this. Um, I have rubbed up the career services the wrong way, various points in the last 10 years. I'm going to keep saying it. I do not know what they are doing. Um, they are perfectly placed to talk to all the students. They've got all your email addresses. They're on campus and I don't know what they're doing, frankly, because I don't know why so many people are coming out of university with no idea what to do. They either went to their career service and then walked straight out again or they didn't go in at all. So something is really going wrong there. Plus, frankly, you should also know that unpaid internships are illegal because this is basic. It's like a basic, really important thing that you should know. Um, you should also have a vague idea how to, how to get a graduate job. You don't. I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm saying it's their fault. Just to be clear. So basically, I wrote the book because I think universities do a pretty bad job of this. They always complain that they're really badly funded, blah, blah, blah. But hey, I mean, I'm not funded either. And I'm doing a better job than they are. So frankly, um, <laughs> I'm not quite sure what to say about that. So, so basically, I, I mean, I wrote the book because frankly, it's not rocket science getting a graduate job. And I always say, if you're smart enough to get a degree, then you're smart enough to work out how to get a job. What the problem I think that lots of graduates have um, and students pre-graduation is that not only is it a kind of practical um, and intellectual task, which you're more than capable of doing, it's also got an emotional element to it, um, which is what I think bogs you down and makes it really difficult. So, so typical mistakes people make is to sit there sort of um, hoping that kind of inspiration is going to strike and they're going to magically know what they want to do with their life. That's a typical one. Or so they just don't do anything um, or they panic and apply for everything in like a completely mad scattergun, crazy, like madness. So which which also isn't useful. Um, or there's there's a sort of fear that you have to get you have to get it right first time. You've got to pick what you want to do for the rest of your life and then just do it. So I also challenge that. So so I think before you think about what how to get a job, the, the better question to ask first is what am I looking for? What am I doing here? And, and if you don't know what you want to do, if you're not one of those people that wants to be a doctor or a lawyer, by the way, those people sometimes change their minds, can I just say? Anyway, if you haven't got something particular in mind, um, I actually think the smartest thing to do is to use that to your advantage, basically. So just the fact that you're flexible on what you might want to do is great. So I, re I really, really wouldn't worry about that. And also... The world, the world of work, but also, hello, the whole world is changing so fast right now that what you decide you might want to do now, that, that industry might not exist in 10 years' time. It certainly won't exist in 20 years' time or 30 years' time, or if it does, it will look completely different. So, so I, think, I think what I'm such a big fan of is getting students and graduates to switch their brains on and not just think about what am I, you know, what's my little job going to be and what am I going to pick and then just do? You've got to see yourself in the context of the wider world. And I also tell people to go where the growth is, by which I mean go into industries which are thriving, where there is money, where, I don't mean necessarily where the jobs are really well paid, but where people are investing in it, where the future lies. Don't go into something that's dying on its ass, frankly, because it's not <laughs> going to get any better. So I talked to you as somebody who, who spent 10 years basically building actually quite a decent reputation for myself in the dying industry of print magazines. I would not go into print magazines if I were you, and I would not do that again. So if I could go back and tell my 22-year-old self what to do, it would be, don't do that, Tanya, because it's not a brilliant idea. I should have gone into online and digital and video and all sorts of other stuff that I didn't do. Anyway, listen, the past is the past. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually <laughs> funny that you mentioned a uh, dying industry because... A lot of, for example, arts uh, students are out there complaining about not being able to use uh, their degree effectively. And also, not only that, because they're not allowed to access resources, it does look quite bleak for them when they graduate as well, considering, for example, the late night uh, industry has been closed for almost a year now. And a lot of the industry is either going 
bankrupt or just about standing and we don't know how long this will go on for um obviously with less businesses out there it's going to be more competitive and that's already showing that covid is going to have an impact on the graduate market but we'll get onto that in a bit that's true that's a pretty good example of of using your eyes and what you're noticing generally in being a person walking around in the world and putting that into your career plan essentially you need to bring those two things together they are not separate so i think that's really important i think the, the point you raise about about hospitality is is it a dying industry or is it just having a nap right now mm-hmm. frankly is it dead i don't think it is dead i think it will probably come back with a flourish to be honest i think tourism is going to come back as well so those sorts of things i don't know you have to use your common sense a bit do you think it's going to come back i mean i certainly want to travel i'm desperate to travel aren't you i mean I'm also desperate to go out for a drink. I'm <laughs> desperate to do all of these things. So I can't see those things dying. On the other hand, it's probably not the moment to, to think you're going to launch your career in hospitality right now, the second. There's a lot of stuff you can do in the meantime. Exactly. Like you, I would say, obviously, read the news to know what's going on with the industry that you want to get into, but also consider alternatives. You might be passionate about one industry, but that industry might not be the best for your career path. So always have a backup plan. For example, I myself, I am doing a business management degree. However, I am going to be looking to do a master's in public policy because I want to explore my options. And then maybe at the end, who knows, I could be applying for a firm such as JP Morgan and the other big banks, or I could even be applying for a job within government. But that's just me keeping my options open. And I would also advise you guys to do the same. Don't just fixate yourself on one career path keep your options open read the news and just make sure you're aware of what's going on in your surroundings because believe it or not a lot of people don't actually read the news they'll maybe see the odd article here and there on twitter but they won't see focused news so for example they won't follow certain topics and so they won't know what's going on and that's really not great especially if you're about to graduate or if you've graduated recently um what I was going to ask next is, so you say don't fixate yourself on one path. And also you say to not basically go on an applying spree where you just apply for loads of jobs. Firstly, if you don't want to fixate yourself on one path, is it okay to go and apply for different roles within different industries? If you, for example, got a degree, say, let's say business, so if you do have a business degree and you were fixated on applying for the big four and all the big banks out there as well, is it okay to then have a change of mind and start applying for other roles with that business degree? I'll let you answer that first. Yeah. I mean, listen, you can do whatever you want. It's up to you. I'm just trying to tell you what I think is the smartest use of limited resources. Look, we don't, I know it seems like we've all got endless time right now in a way, but actually you don't have endless time and you don't have endless energy. None of us does. So you've got, so you've got a limit. There is a limit, right? So, so you want to use basically your time and your energy and your focus in the smartest way possible. So, so for that example, if you're maybe looking at kind of big, what people quite often do is they just look at big firms. They just look at the big graduate schemes and there are some great schemes out there. Don't get me wrong. But then if they don't get onto those schemes, they completely fall apart as if there's no other jobs in the whole world. Whereas, of course, there are. There's the smaller companies. Um, and, and by which I mean lots, lots of small companies, so-called small, are actually not small at all. So, so to be an SME, which is a small to medium-sized enterprise, is up to 250 people. Well, 250 people is quite a big company, actually. So these are not like some little person sitting in their kitchen. You know, some of these SMEs are actually quite big companies. So what I would suggest is is either to um, either to cut down to maybe three options of different sorts of careers, or to maybe pick one one sort of role which you think you'd be good at, and then look at look at big firms on one hand, and then look at smaller firms on the other hand. So you need to be a bit strategic. I wouldn't just apply for absolutely everything because you're going to get totally overwhelmed really quickly. It's quite dizzying. You know, you, you're able to think what you're doing. But if you've got, say, a three-pronged plan or a two-pronged plan, 
that's about enough to see what's working and what's not working and to keep track of it in some sort of way. I also think it's really important to get organized, even if you're not an organized person, which I am not, you may be, but I'm not an organized person. Um, but you need to find some way of keeping a record of everything you're doing, um, what's working and what's not working. How many applications have you sent out? Which websites did you use to, to find those roles? Have you heard back? Haven't you heard back? It's really important to keep a track of everything because once you realize what's not working, you can stop doing it because it wasn't working anyway. So the best thing to do is do more of what is working and think, okay, well, I haven't got a job yet, but that website that I used to apply for jobs, I actually got three interviews, you know, from applying for 30 jobs. Well, that's a pretty good hit rate actually to get to interview stage for three jobs. Um, so, so you should use that, use that site again. If you don't hear back from, from something, for God's sake, just stop doing it because it's a waste of your time anyway. You may as well just put the applications in the bin. I agree, though, because there's a company that I won't name, but a quick Google search will uh, reveal it anyways if you search my name. Um, I had quite a bad experience with them when applying for one of their summer internship programs. And instead of sitting there and thinking, why or why, or what went wrong, I just thought, I'm not going to even bother w wasting my time on them again. There are so many other businesses and uh, schemes out there that I might as well just put my energy into that rather than reapplying the next time they open the application. So yeah, I would definitely say, don't be, uh, again, don't be fixated on one uh, grad scheme or internship and be like, oh, I didn't get in. What am I going to do? Just be like, okay, and move on to the next one. You'll um, be pleased to hear that, that um, my club for employers, which is called the Good and Fair Employers Club, I ask um, the companies to sign up to sort of take a test before they can join which is quite hilarious to say to people like Google, are you good enough for my club? Oh. Anyway, um, and, uh, and one of the things is that they have to promise that they respond to every application they receive. Because I think just having that awful tumbleweed moment where you put loads of work into your application and they don't even bother to get back to you. I just think that's not on. I just think that's not okay. So I'm, I'm asking for them to do better. And, and actually, if you're looking for employers, who have that basic minimum standard, then, then you can look up the club yourself and see who's a member. So those are all employers who have pledged to do all these good things. They also um, pay travel expenses to get to interviews. If and when we ever start traveling to get to interviews again, um, they also uh, recruit from a wide variety of universities. Um, you know, they don't mind what school you went to. They don't have unpaid internships. Um, so they have to be good people. So there's a list of 18 com companies at the moment so, yeah, look up the Good and Fair Employers Club. Uh, okay, so next thing. So, obviously, we mentioned don't um, apply for loads of jobs. But at the same time, a lot of people, as we've just touched upon, do only go for the big schemes. So, for example, Deloitte, EY, JP Morgan, etc. Those kind of roles, um, those kind of schemes usually get thousands of applications. And when I say thousands, I don't mean like, 4,000, I mean at least 30,000 applications. So they're really hard to get into. So obviously do look into SMEs as well, small and medium sized enterprises, uh, because at least 50% of the UK's GDP is actually made up of SMEs, which is actually quite massive if you think about it. Um, there are so many businesses out there they don't even know about that do offer opportunities for graduates and they will pay similar. Uh, there's especially startups there are startups that will pay as much as some of these big uh, graduate schemes so do uh, explore your options but in terms of graduate schemes in general is there anything that someone can do to make themselves stand out especially where in a case for example with Deloitte where there are thousands of applications um, okay Deloitte are not in the club I, I hope they will be soon if they're listening right now then give me a call um, <laughs> but um, lots of their competitors are. Um, and what most of the big employers at the moment are saying is that they are looking for people who you would kind of think they might not be looking for. So they're not actually that mad keen on people who have basically always wanted to work at EY, Accenture, those sorts of firms. They're looking for people who almost don't want to work there in a way. Um, so they're looking for people who are bringing something a bit different. So if that's you, I would suggest you get in touch. I would also suggest that you don't panic about the numbers of how, how competitive these schemes are. Um, 
Like if you still think you might be right for them, then do go ahead. Not all the schemes are as competitive as, e as each other. Um, so there are some which are less, where the numbers will be much less and your chances will be much higher. Um, I would also suggest when you're looking at a particular industry, you go for the slightly less well-known names. So for example, so the, you know, everybody knows the big four um, uh, kind of professional services firms, but do you know the names of number eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12? You probably don't. I can tell you some of those names, but you should really do your own research. So, so basically it's that next tier down who actually don't get nearly as many applications as you would think they do because everybody goes for those top four. So, so if you're number 10 on that list, your company, it's actually, you have to work really, really hard to get people to apply because you haven't ever heard of their name. So, so quite often a name you haven't heard of is worth applying to. And actually quite often what you find is that they're actually huge in Europe or they're massive in America and we just haven't heard of them here, but it doesn't mean they're not a big company and actually could mean that you've got chances to travel. If you join that firm, you can go and work in the States for a few years. So there's a lot, there's a lot to be gained from maybe looking outside of the most obvious um, schemes and the big names that you already know, because there's a lot of companies out there and you only know, you've only heard of a fraction of them. Okay, so that's uh, good as well. But what can you do to make yourself stand out amongst all those people? Because for ty there'll be loads of, for example, volunteering schemes that will say, this will look great on your CV. But then if everyone has something that will look great on your CV, does that really make you stand out? It, what is, is there something you can do to make truly make yourself stand out amongst all of the people that are applying? Yeah. So I started to answer that question and I think I didn't quite clarify what I meant, which is that you need to show them that there's something special about you and that you're not the typical type that they usually hire. So, because that is actually what they're looking for. They have plenty of very samey people. They've been hiring all the same people for years and years and years. And now this year and last year, but particularly this year, what they want is people that are different. So you need to show them that you're different. And that can, that can look lots of different ways. But for example, you'd be surprised how keen they are to hear from people who maybe didn't go to posh schools, who didn't go to posh universities, who just basically aren't the typical and that think slightly differently. So if you're particularly entrepreneurial, say for example, you've started your own YouTube channel, um, but things like that are a really, really good example. And you know, obviously not, not everyone's gonna do that, but showing that you have done something that you have started from scratch or you have led people in some way, like you've started some kind of community or club um, and you haven't just done it to say that you've done it, you've done it because it's who you are and you have that potential within you. That is how you stand out. It's not about what experience you've got on your CV. It's showing them that you bring something different that they don't already have. Rather than trying to fit into what you think their mold is, you've kind of got to have the guts, if you like, to be a bit different. So for example, they, um, they've actually really changed their thinking on this. So they used to hire based on what they call polish, which means things like kind of social confidence and all the things that having been to private school, particularly young people are much better at if they've had that kind of, that kind of schooling and your parents are, pretty affluent and, and pretty articulate and are used to, you know, you're used to presenting and you're confident in that kind of way. Now they're like, actually, we, we've got enough of those people. We can teach you how to talk to a group or whatever. That's fine. We can teach you that. What we're really looking for is people who, who have got that real kind of, kind of innate charisma and kind of get up and go and passion and, um, and have actually maybe not been doing um, a, a smart unpaid internship at some posh place, but have actually been helping their grandmother who's disabled and doing that, you know, for four days a week, um, you, you know, so she doesn't have to go out and get her own shopping during COVID. That's, they actually want to hear about that stuff. Weirdly enough, they love that stuff. So you need to tell them about stuff that you don't even think is impressive, but they think is impressive. And where exactly would you communicate this? Would you put it into your cover letter? Would you put it into your CV? Would you wait until there's an interview to talk about it? Well, mention it in, in the application for start because there's no point holding it back because they won't know about it. And if you don't get the interview, you'll never get the chance to tell them. But certainly 
when, when you read the question in the application, don't assume they're just asking about what you think of as work experience, because what they actually are asking for is for, is to show you, is, is for you to show them that you've got skills and that you've got something special about you. And you could have done that in, in many, many different ways, having never had any work experience whatsoever. You've probably got stuff. If you've been doing anything other than sitting on your bum, you've been doing something. You know, the thing that you care about most in the world is of interest to them if you've done something cool. I think that's uh, something to note as well, because not only does uh, it usually ask about work experience, it usually says relevant work experience. But the word relevant is subjective. Like, what is, what is relevant? For example, what I think is relevant may differ to what you think is relevant. So would you, basic, would you basically argue that just put it down anyways if you've been doing something in your own time, that even if you don't feel it's relevant? I would, yeah. And I would expect this year, I mean, you say they're asking about work experience. I would say, particularly for the, for the sort of class of 2021 coming up, they are very aware that you are not going to have a lot of work experience because frankly, there hasn't been a lot of work out there. There's not a lot of jobs that, that you can do right now. So they, the good news I suppose is that, is that just as you're panicking about not being able to get work experience, they are realizing that no one's gonna have any work experience this year because what the hell could you possibly be doing? I mean, there are limited options, which is why things like volunteering will, will come in handy. Um, and, you know, helping your mum to, to, you know, with your younger siblings, for example, they love all that stuff. So, so they're going to have to be more flexible on those questions. And I would expect them to, to say something like what relevant work experience or projects outside of your, of work, you know, to, be, to ask the, the question in a more flexible way. And that's what they're saying is they know you haven't probably been doing some smart internship somewhere paid or otherwise. They know because what, what could you have been doing? I think this is actually great that we've uh, naturally gone onto this because I'm actually going to bring up uh, unpaid internships because you say to obviously COVID hasn't really presented the opportunity to get much experience. And also we've been saying to do something that will make yourself stand out. For example, you, you use me as an example as a YouTuber, uh, but not everyone's going to become a YouTuber. You could, for example, start your own business or I don't know, a volunteer at somewhere. But if, if, for example, volunteering is free work, why is an unpaid internship so bad? And more so, if it's illegal, why does it still happen? And how, why don't enough students know that it's illegal as well? Well, I think I answered that last question when I was slagging off career services. Why don't people know about it? I don't know, because they're not telling you. You can talk to them about that. Maybe you should ask them why they're not telling you that and say it would, be, would have been useful to know that. Um, listen... I'm not saying unpaid internships are bad in themselves. I don't have a go at, at students and graduates who do them. I totally see why you do them because you think you have to do them and you haven't got a lot of options, but that, that essentially is proof to me that you, whether you like it or not, and no one really likes this idea, but you are, you are a vulnerable worker effectively. If you're prepared to work for free because you need the experience, and, that, and you won't complain about it, and you won't complain about it during the internship, and you won't complain about it afterwards, which you can do, by the way, you can claim your salary back, get onto that later. People don't do that because they're vulnerable, because you're at the start of your career, you need the reference, you want the experience, you're hoping it will turn into a paid job. I mean, you know, sorry, but that is actually the dictionary definition of being vulnerable. You can't, you just don't have the usual leverage, if you like, that most people have when they choose whether to do a job or not. And you can leave and you can come and go. You can say, I don't like this or I don't want to work for that money or whatever it is. So I think, I think you're in a particularly tough spot. And I'd never have a go at people that do unpaid internships, even though, and I, because I think, I think it's very easy to say, oh, you know, this is, this is rich kids versus poor kids. And, and I know that that's, that's a narrative that is very easy for people to kind of understand, but actually it doesn't really reflect the reality. There's not that many people that can afford to work unpaid endlessly, really. Um, so it's, and, and you know, in the middle, you've got people who can afford to work unpaid, you know, for a week, but not a month, or for three months, but not six months. Um, so it's not, I mean, I just wanna get away from this whole idea that it's up to you to decide whether you should work unpaid or not. These, these unpaid work just shouldn't exist. If you're doing work, that, that basically would be done by a paid member of staff if you weren't there, 
then the law says that you have to be paid. And it's not just there to protect you, it's there to protect everyone that can't afford to work for free. So it's really about like seeing the big picture here. So listen, I've been banging on about this for 10, actually 11 years. Go I've on. actually seen, <laughs> uh, I believe, an article from Tanya in The Guardian back in 2010. <sighs> 2010. Uh, internships. I actually looked, uh, some of the articles go back even to the 2008 recession, if I'm uh, correct. And, and weirdly, so, they haven't, it hasn't dated, has it? It's the same old stuff. Yeah, we're, we're 2008 recession and now 2020, 2021 20, recession. I know I was there. I told you I was there. <laughs> I've done it all. I've seen it all. I mean, I know that there's, there's, you know, sadly, there is no end to the ingenuity of employers who want to continue to get something for nothing and basically screw you over. So they can just like squeeze unpaid work out of you. Now, listen, the point of this is that actually, partly because of all the, all the campaigning work that I and people like me have done, is that there now is a bit of a stink about unpaid internships. And actually, good companies don't have unpaid interns. Now, I know you're going to say that I'm wrong, but I'm not wrong. So, so there are various industries where, where unpaid internships persist and I would say it's probably not a coincidence that these are the industries where unpaid internships started so I would say fashion I would say media I would say politics are particularly bad um, but in general most big companies particularly and actually frankly most most smaller companies now can join the dots between unpaid work and ending up with a workforce which is not very diverse because they can see that actually, if, if you make, if you, if you insist that the first kind of rung in the career ladder to get into your organization is an unpaid role for three months or six months or something, then guess what? You've just said goodbye to a whole load of talent. That's you guys, by the way, that's what they call you, talent. Um, you, you can't afford to work for free. You've just discounted them by magic. When actually, if you had just paid a proper wage, not a huge wage, but a wage someone could survive on, you could have picked the genuinely the best person, whereas now you've got to pick the best person out of the small number of people who can afford to work unpaid. So, so it doesn't actually work for the businesses either. And then guess what happens? They, they look around the room and they're like, oh my God, it's so weird that only white posh people work here. And you're like, well, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? Look at how you've been hiring for the last five, 10, 15 years with that as a barrier to the world of work. And guess what? You just hired the same person again and again and again. And they actually don't want that anymore. So they've actually realized that's not really the way to go. It's not a good way to save money. So good companies should invest in young people. And, and I think once you found people that pay, you, you, it's kind of like that they've already, they're like waving a big flag saying, we're a good company. We get it. We care about the fact that you can survive. Like we understand that you need to earn money and your financial background, whether you're super posh and your dad has like a castle, you still shouldn't be working for free. Your work is of the same value as someone else's work when they don't have that stuff. So like, it's just not about how much money your family have got. That's completely irrelevant. It's just not relevant to the conversation. So if you just say, listen, and we do have, we have a minimum wage law in this country, which we say that we're proud of, and yet we don't enforce it for young people. That's a whole other, that's a whole other podcast or whatever. But there is, I, yeah, there is also the narrative that young people get screwed over so much more than uh, mature people because they don't know as much. And so these uh, companies will target them knowing that. And so basically, you know, the saying, learn your rights. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's tough because, because I know that it feels like you have to do this stuff. And, and if, and if the real tragedy about it really is that if young people just stopped working for free, if you just, all of you just decided, all students, all graduates just said, sod it, I'm not doing that anymore. No, we're not working for free. The problem disappears overnight. Exactly. So with that in but, mind. But... But listen, Ooh. <laughs> but you don't think that because you're in a tight spot, right? So you, you feel like you need to get the experience in order to get the experience. The only experience you can get is unpaid. So you end up doing this and you're stuck in this revolving door cycle where you're just working longer and longer for longer and longer periods of time with less and less chance of a job at the end of it. Exactly. They'll keep, they'll keep doing it as long as you let them do it. Exactly. But it's not, but see, we, we have a law that should be fighting that battle for you. So you don't have to fight that yourself. But That's unfortunately, the law doesn't always uh, help you. So unless you actually challenge them on that. 
Well, I've been I've... fighting for the law to be enforced for young people, which I don't think is that outrageous an ask, considering that we, you know, we live in a democracy and this is affecting hundreds of thousands of people and has been for the last 11 years. Anyway, I'm going to shut up and let you move on. Go on, ask me the next <laughs> with question. That, with <laughs> that in mind, how do you spot a uh, good or bad uh, internship and even a grad role before even sort of during the application process or even before applying? Okay, first thing is, it's paid, number one, as I've explained. Um, so, so what you're looking for are signs that the employer has really thought this through. The more thought they have put into this role, the more likely they are to take it seriously, the more likely it is that once you start the role, it's going to be good. You're going to have a proper manager. You know, they're going to have a plan for what you're doing, you know, and, and it's going to be a good role. Whereas if they've just like gone, oh, let's just get, you know, some kind of intern slash graduate in. Let's just get them in for a six month kind of trial and let's pay them, you know, just above minimum wage, whatever. It just like, like looks like they haven't really thought it through. So the more clear they are on what this job actually is, that's a really good sign for you that it's actually going somewhere. So, so looking looking to see how much care they have taken this should it should really be advertised widely as well if they're serious about getting the best people they should be advertising it widely however in the same breath i'm also going to say one of the best things that you can do to maximize your chances of getting a graduate job is to find the roles that aren't advertised so i'm kind of saying both things at the same time here <laughs> you can decide which bits of that advice you want to take. Yeah, I was going to say, um, because maybe SMEs don't know how to advertise as much as, for example, your typical yeah. De Deloitte, JP Morgan, etc. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard for them. So, and actually, in a way, you're kind of looking for a role that few people have heard about that has also been really well thought through. And it's kind of good for you if it hasn't been advertised widely. However, for that company to be really be doing a good job of making sure they get the best person, they should be advertising it wisely, widely, really. Anyway, I'll leave you to work out the paradox of that because my brain's about to explode. Anyway. Is, is there um, anything that you do to basically advertise to graduates specifically uh, any opportunities or basically? I, yeah. I, I don't have any, I don't have any um, staff because I can't afford them. So I could have 10 unpaid interns probably it'd be great experience for them <laughs> but i will not have people working for me for free until i can afford you know until i can afford to pay them i don't get any stuff you can't have what you can't afford so <laughs> i mean i want a castle on a pony but i'm not going to get that because i can't afford it so but um having said that i i would say that that the point you make about actually smaller companies find it harder to find graduates and actually so so in terms of applying speculatively that's a really good thing to do so you find them and think oh that's an interesting company i wonder if they need my help and then you apply to them directly and i have had people write to me at graduate fog and say i really want to write an article about this and i think oh that would be great and i have commissioned them so in that way you know that that would be the best example really is is someone who sorts it through and and has sent me a really targeted email and is like you know i really like this piece this was great i you know i was thinking about this that and the other you know do you want me to write something on this so for example um i i've got pe people to write about things like um dyspraxia and dyslexia which i which i don't know about and and if there's a graduate who comes forward saying saying here are my tips for grad for graduate job hunting with any of these conditions i'm like great and i pay them to do that um because that's worth it to me okay um and is it ever too late to apply for a graduate job what i mean by this is for example there'll be deadlines in like october november december there was uh, even some in january but for example let's say you're in summer watching this video it's Ju july august and you still don't have a graduate job is it ever too late well, the graduate schemes are kind of done on a cycle. So, so you'll typically see loads of stuff advertised in kind of graduate season, which is basically September through to Christmas. And there'll be some of them still knocking around, which they haven't managed to fill yet, kind of January, February is still ongoing. Um, those will be the ones that have been much harder to fill. I would be careful about leaving it too close to the deadline. What I'm hearing anecdotally is that, is that schemes are closing early because there's so many applications this year. So you just, you just kind of want to get it in as soon as you can, basically. Um, if it's too late, you basically mean that you've missed the big graduate schemes, um, but they might still have other roles, which are kind of graduate level roles, but just not part of a program. So it's always worth looking to see if they're looking to fill certain roles because they might have certain kind of gaps. Um, 
if you're applying at a weird time of year, then it, it's probably better to go for not for those big, those big firms and maybe wait until the following year if that's definitely what you want. But listen, in the meantime, why don't you see what else you can get? You know, I mean, I mean, I work with all these big employers, so I shouldn't really say this, but they're not the be all and end all. You know, they are, they are a very specific type of graduate opportunity where you'll work for them for two years and might do a rotation all around their company, or you might do something really specific. And at the end of it, you know, you kind of get absorbed within the business, which is great, which is great if, that, if that's the right thing for you. But listen, I'm kind of fatalistic about these things. If you're not getting into these companies, it might possibly become, be because you're actually not right for them. They're right in rejecting you because you're not right for them. And it's, you wouldn't be happy doing that role anyway. You wouldn't like that company. You think you want to work there, but actually they kind of know who does well at that company, who thrives there, who loves it. And they also know who doesn't because they've done that before as well. So they're looking for people who are a really good long-term bet for them. And so if they look at you and go, he's going to get bored in a year. He's not going to want to work here. This is not a corporate guy. He's not going to like this. Then they're going to reject you. But you want to say, thank you for rejecting me. <laughs> because you've actually, you, you've actually managed to sort of deselect yourself from something that wasn't right for you. So I think it's kind of sometimes about listening to what the universe is telling you. If something isn't working, there might well be a very good reason for it. So maybe try something else. And it's, uh, it's actually funny that you mentioned that uh, grad schemes are closing early this year because there are more applications this year. Is this down to COVID? Should students be worried about COVID? Has COVID affected the graduate um, job market? The market? Yes, it totally has affected the market, but probably not in the ways that you think or for the reasons that you think. Um, so, they, so one of the first things that happened last year was that quite a lot of companies axed their summer internships um, because it was all around that time. They were planning for everything in March and April. And then they were like, oh my God, there's a pandemic. And they just thought, how the hell are we going to do all of our internships? We've got to make them all virtual in like a month. They're like starting in a month and we can't do it. And we don't know how we're going to do it. And we've got to get laptops to everybody. We've got to do something which is, which is as great quality as our real life internships that we do. We've got to crunch all of that content into something shorter, virtual, and we've got to manage all these people. And it, we just don't think we can do it on top of trying to work out what they're doing about their graduate staff and their apprentices and all this sort of stuff. So quite often they're actually quite small teams, even at big companies. And they were all, I mean, I was talking to them through the whole summer and it was variations on, oh my God, this is a nightmare. They were not sitting there thinking, how can we screw over young people? Let's cancel all the internships. They were basically thinking, oh my God, how do we run what they call early careers, which is graduates and internships and apprenticeships. How the hell are we going to do this this year? So, it just wasn't basically top of their list of things to do was to think about amazing ways to give you amazing experiences. So they, so they, they very sadly, some of them had to, had to bin their internships. They didn't do that to save money and they did it because they just didn't have time and they couldn't think how to make it great. So, so coming back to that idea, they kind of, you're also seeing like fewer numbers of roles for some of these companies. And again, it's less likely to be to save money and it's more about them thinking actually we don't need that many people for that department that we usually do because COVID has changed their entire business. So for example for a bank, for a retail bank like you see on the high street, they might be thinking we're not going to have branches in a couple of years time, therefore we don't need all of those apprentice apprentices or all those branch managers, all those people. We, what we actually need is a different bit of, bit of the bank which you would probably never know even existed, but they need more people there. So they're trying to work out like who they need, which has totally changed from before the pandemic. So it's not usually about saving money. It's about them thinking, who do we need? We don't want to hire a bunch of people that we are just going to sit there sharpening their pencils, who are going to be disappointed that we've hired them and then we haven't got proper jobs for them to do. So they're just trying to work out what the hell their business is going to look like in a year's time so to work out who they need. So, so I know that's not very helpful for you, but what it basically means is that there is no conspiracy that is trying to basically pull up the drawbridge and mean that there are no jobs for young people. It's that they are trying to work out what the hell they're doing with all these companies. <laughs> so uh, so that's, that's what's going on. We, we did touch upon earlier uh, ways to make yourself stand out uh, despite all these applications coming in and more so than ever. But 
if you are still worried about uh, being in such a competitive environment, well, a competitive environment that's become even more competitive, is it worth taking a year out from applying for uh, grad roles to, for example, study a master's degree or go uh, do some volunteering to boost your CV or just simply uh, find other ways, for example, starting your own business, etc. Just ways to boost your own uh, profile so that you can have a better chance when the economy strengthens a bit more. Is it worth doing that or would you still say there's hope and basically uh, business as usual? Um, I'm a big, big fan of doing masters if you know exactly why you're doing it and exactly what you're going to get from the end of it and where you're going to go with it afterwards particularly and if you're sure it's going to have that that value for you so I think that's great I think with the other things that you mentioned I don't really see any reason why you can't be volunteering at the same time as applying for jobs or run your own thing at the same time as applying for jobs like oh sorry no just to uh, clarify I meant that um, instead of committing yourself to a new job I mean take a year out to have, have a long-term experience in a volunteering role and then when the next cycle comes, start applying. So okay. that you I mean, you could do that. You could do that. I probably wouldn't, to be honest, um, because I think it's better to get some, some decent commercial experience under your belt. And I think now is a slightly weird time, given that you can't go traveling, which is what people would usually do in this situation. Um, and a lot of people did that in the last recession. They just went traveling. Um, because they were like, well, I'll just, you know, I'll come back in a year's time when the market's better. I think it made more sense than I would say at the moment. I think you just, you try and make the best of whatever you can get going at the moment um, and try and get whatever's going to look as, not, not even look good on your CV, but give you something to talk about in interviews. I should also have mentioned a really good thing to do is lots of big companies are doing, are running lots of kind of workshops and boot camps and thing, things at the moment, which are free. So, for example, EY are doing some great stuff this week, which I know will have been by the time this comes out, but um, they're doing great stuff on confidence and motivation, um, and that's all free, and you don't even need to apply to EY. Um, Vodafone do lots of cool stuff as well. So they're running lots of these kind of boot camps for graduates and students, so take advantage of those, and that's a great thing to then say that you've done. So, so lots of firms say that they're really impressed if, people, if students have taken the chance to do say some two-day you know training boot camp thing that you know you didn't have to pay for they're like that just shows that you did, did something with the time rather than just sitting on your bum waiting for the market to pick up that's not a great look and it doesn't give you anything to talk about in an interview so you really want to think about you know anything that you can spin into a story if you know when because it will be a question of when you end up sitting in front of an interviewer and they say what well, you know what did you do during the, count the pandemic and you're like, oh, I sat on my ass and hope for the market to get better. I mean, that's not a great look, is it? So you just want to show some stuff. You're like, well, this was tough. So I tried this and it didn't work. I tried this and it sort of worked. And then I did more of this. And then I started running this club with lots of my friends. And then it became kind of bigger than we expected. And then we made it a neighborhood thing or whatever it is that you've done. You just need to do something. What you don't want is a massive COVID shaped gap on your CV where it just looks like you just sat there and did nothing. Um, but you don't need to do a lot in order to kind of fill that gap a bit, I think, to be, to, to be impressive. Okay. I think, to be honest, we have covered all bases there, and I'm also conscious of the time on the video. Uh, earlier, we did touch upon br uh, briefly your book, which is free, by the way. So there's, it's not like one of these uh, videos where, oh, for twelve ninety nine or on a subscription plan, you can become a graduate like no it's free no don't worry we're about that <laughs> I, I, worked really hard. Below. I, I worked really really hard to squeeze money out of out of these um you'll see the firms that have contributed i worked really really hard to hustle some money out of them so that you wouldn't have to pay for that book anyway it's an ebook um i do have a print version of it knocking around my flat but <laughs> it's basically an ebook so you just download it and it's free so i would uh, is there anything that you'd like to say specifically about that book anything that uh people might find interesting within there yeah the thing to add is and i know we haven't really talked about that that much today but i know that there's a lot of psychological challenge to do with this job hunt we've talked a lot about the practical stuff today but it's hard it's just hard it's hard going you can feel quite flat you lose your confidence quite quickly and it's quite difficult to get moving again there's a whole chapter on confidence and motivation in this book because i know how hard it is, particularly when you're at home, particularly when you're back at home with your parents, 
like I would, ex you know, it's so easy for people just to say, oh, you know, treat your job hunt like a job. And you're like, oh, shut up. Because actually that's really, really hard to do because you just kind of lose motivation quite quickly. Now, what I talk about a lot in the book is how to get that back and how to get that energy going again and how to get something from every day that you've got something from every week. And if a day isn't a good day, then you'd be like, oh, I won't do that again. Maybe let's try something different tomorrow. So, you know, things like getting out of the house and going for a run, even if you really don't want to go for a run, but doing, putting stuff in place and also getting organized with your job hunt. So I would, I would, I suppose I would say for anybody graduating this summer, just be aware that it might be tougher than you think kind of psychologically and to expect that. And there's nothing weird about that, but to be ready for it and have a little plan. So that's, so there's a lot of stuff in the book about that as well. Yeah, I think it's also worth noting that you, when you're applying, try and think of it as you're applying without COVID in, uh, it is a thing because otherwise you're going to be worried like, oh, it's going to be so difficult to get a job, COVID, this, COVID, that. So when you are applying, just don't think COVID, just think of it as a normal grad role as if we were in, I don't know, 2018 when COVID wasn't a thing. One more thing to add. Um, companies need young people they will always need young people they need your energy they need your ideas they need your passion the thought of them just going oh let's just not hire anybody this year is not going to happen because they'd basically be killing the talent the talent that they need to kind of come up over the years so they've done that before where they've where they've basically kind of cancelled all their all their um, graduate stuff one year they did, it, they did it in the last recession and it didn't work out for them they are not going to do that they need you so they're not doing you a favor by hiring you. They need you. So let's, let's make sure that we all value ourselves and, and uh, you know, the, com the contribution that you bring because, because your work is worth something to them. It really is. And I would also say that my personal advice, um, obviously I'm going to be doing a master's degree. I've been documenting my uh, application process. So if you haven't checked that out, then make sure to go over my channel and look at that. But my advice with uh, applying for grad roles is similar to what I've been doing with uh, master's degrees is, let's say you identify 10 grad, role, uh, grad schemes that you like. Don't just apply for all of them in one day because you will burn yourself out and then it will deter you from applying for more in the future if one pops up. Set yourself a target of maybe one or two applications a day and just spread it out. Um, as long as you're within the deadline, obviously some do have rolling deadline based on how many applications they get, but don't uh, just do all of it at once. Do spread uh, one or two a day. It's fine and obviously it will be better for you in the long term in terms of your energy and let's say you spent one day doing 10 applications and then you managed to get rejected from eight of them and then you got an application for two uh, you know, an interview for two of them you might sit there and think oh that was a massive waste of a day i can't be asked i don't want to do this again so if you do it spread it out then you won't get that feeling as much so that is my advice uh, there um, is there any closing points, basically, like a summary, Tanya, that you'd like to provide? Um, no, I would just say that, you know, this is, you know, this is a tough spot that you're in. It's not a great year to be graduating, but I think there's, I think if you do it in a smart way, listen, I can't create jobs out of thin air. You know, that's not what the book is about. What the book is about is about maximizing your chances of being someone that does get a job this year. And also you're just looking for something just for the next kind of six months to a year. So I would say don't worry too much about what you're going to do long term if it's not obvious to you right now. I would kind of park that and just think much kind of shorter term. And also that employers out there are very aware that this is a really tough time to be graduating. So they will cut you some slack. Um, so you don't have to be perfect and you don't have to have all this amazing experience. Who knows that you won't? So, so they, they might be kinder than you think. And if they're not kinder than you think, then you probably don't want to work for them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I think that's a perfect closing point to be honest but that is going to be it for the video uh, guys and girls if you did enjoy it then make sure to leave a like comment below and subscribe and obviously if you're new here then make sure to click the subscribe button and click the bell to turn all post notifications on so that you don't miss out on a single video as soon as it goes live I'd like to thank Tanya for appearing today on the channel uh, all of her links will be in the description below, including Graduate Fog and the book. Um, I'm sure she would be willing to answer any questions if you 
I have Twitter. Do you have Twitter? I do. Yeah. Okay. I will I leave a link to Twitter as well. <laughs> uh, so if you do have any questions directed at her, then you'll be able to ask her. Um, make sure to follow me on my social media. That's at Mahel Khan on Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok. At Mahel X on Twitter and official Mahel Khan on Facebook. Let me know in the comments below as well if you'd like to see any more videos like this. Uh, I do actually like these long form videos. I did one for IB versus A levels. I believe that currently has over 6,000 views and a lot of people did like that. And so I'm hoping this will be of help to you as well. So if you want to see uh, similar videos, for example, master's degrees or another, a part two even for graduate jobs, maybe diving into something specific, for example, personal statement, CV, etc., then do let me know in the comments below. I've been Mihail with Tanya teaching you how to get a graduate job in the UK and I will see you in the next one. Peace.